speaking of part of the family, just a little bit, and I'm not going to go too far into his biography here because I know he, a lot of you folks know a lot more about him than I do, but just a little bit of background on our speaker today. Bruce Coey, uh, he was in the Air Force ROTC in 1962, and he was commissioned as second lieutenant graduating in 1966. Following flight school, he found himself in Vietnam in 1968, flying the C-7A. He flew close to 900 combat hours. That goes back to my, combat before, my comment before the cumulative hours of flight time. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you all again. It's, it's amazing to me uh, how much has been sacrificed for this country on your behalf. And I, I just can't thank you enough. Um, following his time in the service, departed from the service in 1972, joined Western Airlines in December of 1972, and continued on with his flying career until the events of 9-11 started to change things again. And then he entered in the field of becoming an author, of course, and he's got all these volumes talking about that experience and all the experience that we have shared in this room. So how about a hand today for our featured speaker, Mr. Bruce Kelly. Thank you very much, Greg, and I uh, can't thank all of you enough for being here. And every time I have the opportunity to talk about these wonderful guys and these amazing books that we've put together, it's uh, really an honor. Now, I've lost my notes, so I'm going to talk uh, extemporaneously. <laughs> um, what I want to do today is, if you guys can come away with a real appreciation for oral history, that's the... Uh, best thing that can come out of this, because we have four volumes, 137 chapters, each one of them written by a combat veteran, and the stories are just, uh, just wonderful, and there are little tidbits of history you'll find in these stories that you might not find in the history books, because these guys were there, they experienced things, saw things, and wrote about them, and it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I've learned a lot thought I knew these guys. I worked with them at the airline, but uh, most of them never talked about Vietnam, so it was uh, kind of a chore. Some of them uh, held out until the fourth volume and finally wrote their stories, but uh, we had quite, a, uh, quite an interesting time. But before I start, I'd really like to thank the museum again and tell you what a close connection this museum has to Western Airlines. Now, they've moved the airplanes around a little bit, but used to be you'd walk out the door and the F-105 and the F-100 part right side by side. And you'll see signatures on the fuselage. And there are several Western pilots who've signed those airplanes. And if we're at the F-105 first, you'll see the signatures of Jerry Stamps and Dennis Wills. Now, those two guys flew the F-105 in combat and came home and eventually separated from the service and went to work for Western Airlines. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. They're both here today, and if you were ever in the vicinity of seeing an F-105 pilot who flew the airplane in combat, it would be a rare experience. Because, uh, these guys, they suffered horrendous losses. They had something like 800 and some F-105s at the beginning of the war, and they lost half of them lost close to 400 F-105s in the skies over North Vietnam and over Laos. And when we get into something uh, which is called the rules of engagement, um, you'll maybe understand why we lost so many airplanes and why it all came about. But for now, I'd like to show you a picture. If I do this right. OK. This is Dennis Wills. He's standing beside his F-105 57 years ago on the flight line at uh, Karad Air Base in Thailand. You can see he's uh, casually leaning against a 750-pound iron bomb and getting ready to fly a mission. And I asked him what his mission was that day, and he said, a target up north. Well, you're going to find out what a target up north means, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the amazing thing about this picture, and I just, I just love a picture that tells stories, Dennis named his airplane Mr. Toad. And I always thought that was Mr. Toad's wild ride. I thought that was just because the airplane, he was going to have a wild ride. 
But he named his airplane Mr. Toad after his three-year-old son, Toby. He called him Toad, and this is from Mr. Toad's Wild Ride from Wind in the Willows. Well, Dennis is here today with his son, Toby. And that's the kind of thing you can't even make that up. That's uh, what a wonderful story. I'm going to get into the rules of engagement a bit, but Mr. Toad, that airplane, survived for a couple of years after Dennis came home, and it was shot down and destroyed. The um, airplane that Jerry Stamps is standing next to in his story was shot down and destroyed. And it's, uh, the losses were pretty horrific, and those guys flew with one hand tied behind their back, sometimes two hands, uh, with the restrictions that were placed on them. And yet they went to work every day, flew their missions, they stayed stuck with their buddies, and they were losing squadron mates and friends on a regular basis. And it's uh, pretty amazing. So to have those two guys here today, uh, really, uh, it's an honor for me to see Dennis and Jerry and, and to meet Toby. Pretty neat. We had a third Western pilot who flew the F-105 in combat. And his name was Bob Spielman. Bob passed away a few years ago, but he's also written a story for these books. So we have the stories of all three F-105 pilots in these books, and it's, uh, it's quite a story. You'll hear about things you won't read in the history books, about uh, Jerry Stamps arriving at, at uh, Karad Air Base in 1964 when they didn't have quarters for the crews, and they didn't have enough bombs, they didn't have anything. But the Air Force just like all the services, they, everybody counted things. The Army had body counts, while the Air Force and the Navy had uh, sortie counts. So they had to fly the airplanes, and if they went up with one bomb on the airplane, they could log a sortie, and that's what they did, and uh, put these guys at risk just so they could log the sorties. It's uh, unbelievable stuff, but things that uh, you might not, might not read in the history books. So now we're going to walk over to the F-100, which is right out the door, and you'll see a signature fellow by the name of Stan Franks. Now, Stan is here today with his wife, Ginger, and Stan flew the F-100 on a three-year tour in England, came home, and at a certain point he transitioned to the F-4 Phantom, and he flew the F-4 on his combat tour in Vietnam. He was based at Da Nang, and he's written a wonderful story for these books. So. It's just uh, pretty special to have all these guys here today. We have close to 50 of the pilots who wrote stories for these books who are here today. And I guarantee you, you'll never be around a, a group like this again. So it's a rare occasion for the audience to get to be around these guys. They're a pretty special group. So I would tell the museum, now they've got an F-4 out here. If you've got an F-4 and an A-4 and you want some signatures, Enough Western pilots could fill the fuselage with signatures because we had, uh, in our group that wrote stories for the books, we had just under 100 Western pilots, just a snapshot of the Western pilot group. And we had 23 who flew the F-4 and 17 who flew the A-4. And those airplanes were flown by multiple services. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps flew the F-4, and the Navy and Marine Corps flew the A-4. And we have pilots who flew those airplanes for all the services. So anything you want to know about how the Air Force versus the Marines versus the Navy, how they flew the airplane and missions they flew and the way the airplanes were configured, uh, you'll find it all in these books. The, the history is just truly, truly phenomenal. So what I'd like to do, this is according to Dale Carnegie in The Art of Public Speaking, if you choose your audience, Choose an audience you don't have to explain too much to. And I think this is, this is the perfect audience. So what I'm going to do is ask a question and let it sit for a little while, and we'll answer that question from excerpts from two of the stories from the books. And those two stories are uh, just guys writing down what they experienced, what they saw, what they thought about it. And there's a couple of gems of history that I didn't know. And um, I've done quite a bit of research, so it's very interesting. But the question is, basically, how did North Vietnam, which was a third world country with no industrial base, 
How did they create the most potent air defense system that the world has ever seen? And that's not my opinion. That's pretty much a direct quote from the book Fighter Pilot by Robin Olds. He was a famous Army Air Corps fighter ace in World War II, had aerial victories over Europe in the P-51, the P-38, and he was still on active duty in 1966. And September of 66, he came to Ubon Air Base in Thailand to be the wing commander of an F-4 fighter wing. And we have a pilot here, one of our guys, Ron Manti, was at Ubon when Robin Olds arrived. Ron's here with his wife, Sharon, and Ron can attest to the, what Robin Olds was all about. He showed up and he wasn't going to be a sit-behind-the-desk commander. He was going to go out and fly, find out what his guys were dealing with flying over the north. And in his book, his quote is, the air defense system over North Vietnam far exceeded anything I had to deal with over Germany in World War II. And that's really saying something. So how did that all come about? Well, we're going we're to get into that and see, see how it all happened. But Robin Olds tells of flying missions and all the targets that were off limits to them when they were over the north. And he said they'd fly up from Laos, through Laos, from Thailand, and then into North Vietnam. He said the early warning radars the North Vietnamese had off limits, rules of engagement. The North Vietnamese air bases were off limits. The North Vietnamese MiGs were off limits. They had to be in the air. So if you saw them park at the end of the runway with their engines running, waiting for you to go by, couldn't do anything about it. You had to fly by with your hands tied behind your back, and they were right on your tail. It was just an amazing story. And you wonder who wrote those rules, and what, what, what was that all about? Well, it basically, the whole war was run out of the White House by LBJ and Robert McNamara, who chose the targets and chose the things that were off limits. But I'll get a little ahead of myself, so I want to get back to North Vietnam and their air defense system. I'm going to start with a, a story by a Western pilot by the name of Paul Brown. Paul was a, uh, very early on, he was there in 1964, he flew the A-1, which they called the SPAD. He was a SPAD pilot in squadron VA-52, which was on board the USS Ticonderoga. And in 1964, his squadron was tasked with practicing dropping aerial mines with the intent of mining Haiphong Harbor. This is 1964, before the Gulf of Tonkin incident, before the bombing had even started over North Vietnam. And he said they practiced for a while, came back to Ticonderoga, and then they uh, scrapped the whole idea. And Haiphong Harbor probably took in 85 to 90 percent of the war material that came in to the North Vietnamese came from the Eastern Bloc. So, Haiphong Harbor was not mined, but was wide open for the entire duration of the war from 64 to 72, and was finally mined in September of 72, and that's another whole story. But while it was open, it was also off limits. The harbor was uh, strictly rules of engagement. Nothing could be attacked in the harbor. Everything that came and went had a free ride, and that's where the entire air defense system came in. SAM missiles, radar systems, the radar guided anti-aircraft guns, the ammunition for them, all the small arms ammunition, the things that were used that basically ended up in South Vietnam and ended up killing Americans and our allies, the South Vietnamese, the South Koreans, the uh, Filipinos, the Aussies, New Zealanders. All of that stuff came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail after coming in through Haiphong Harbor and getting trucked down to the, to the DMZ and then through the uh, different uh, infiltration routes. Now, I'm going to have to back up right now because I forgot something. I want to tell about Eric Jensen's airplane out here. We have, there's an A7 Corsair with the name Eric Jensen on the canopy rail. And Eric is here with his wife, Jo. Eric flew that airplane off the uh, USS Coral Sea in 6970. And he flew that 
particular airplane. It was in his squadron, VA-82. He flew that airplane on a combat mission. So we talk about the connection to the museum and Western Airlines. So I didn't mean to slip that out. I also, I have four gentlemen over here in the Stetson cab hats who uh, you have probably noticed. The, they are from a Aero Scout unit that, um, if you know how the cavalry operated, they had scouts that were on horseback. Well, these guys were flying the Loach, the OH-6A Loach, and their, their story is legend. It's in a book, Low Level Hell, by Q Mills, and uh, they're here as my guest. My friend Ken Snyder from Reno has introduced me to these fellows, so sorry I left that part out because I don't have my notes, but that's good. I, I remember. So, now we'll jump back to the rules of engagement. Paul Brown tells that story about they were going to mine Haiphong Harbor, they scrapped the plan, that plan was scrapped at the White House, and the harbor remained open, all that equipment and military gear came in through the harbor for the next eight years. And the sad thing is that um, it's, just, it's just kind of kind of unbelievable how all that happened. But I'm going to tell you from Paul Brown's story, we're going to jump to a story by a gentleman by the name of Dick Fur. Uh, Dick is here today with his wife, Barbara. I can't thank him enough for being here. Dick was a, a fighter pilot. He flew the F-8 Crusader, and he's on board the aircraft carrier USS Oriskany on a combat cruise. He had two cruises, one in 65 and one in 66. Now, the main job of the F-8s, the fighter guys, was to basically guard the bombers on their, on their bombing missions. And they called that, maybe called that TARCAP, Target Combat Air Patrol. So they would go out with the bombers and protect them from MiGs or whatever, whatever the threats were, and then come back to the carrier and guard them all the way back. Well, he has a quote just casually mentioned in his story about flying over North Vietnam in 1965. And he said, in 1965, we had complete command of the air over North Vietnam. Now, that's really saying something. But here's what he did see. He said, there were areas that were totally off limits. There was a 30-mile radius around the city of Hanoi that was always off limits. They couldn't bomb anything there. They couldn't even fly over that area. And the North Vietnamese were frantically building sites for the radars and for the SAM missiles and for the radar-guided anti-aircraft guns that were going to be delivered through Haiphong Harbor, which we conveniently left open for them. So this entire system was built with us sitting and watching. And then you turn around and read stories like, I just Googled Operation Rolling Thunder just to see what it said about that. And that was the first bombing missions over North Vietnam that started in 65 and went through 68, November 68. And it says uh, Rolling Thunder was a failure. Well, how could it not be a failure? We, <laughs> we left all their targets unopposed. We couldn't shoot, couldn't close their air bases, couldn't do anything. And um, it's really remarkable that all these guys who flew missions then flew their missions every day, and they're certainly just incredible men of honor. It's really, a, really an incredible story. But uh, Dick, Dick flew two cruises, and I said, 1965, they watched the North Vietnamese build these facilities, and they knew when they came back it was going to be a whole different ball game because the SAM sites and the radar-guided anti-aircraft guns, all that stuff was going to be active when they came back. And he did come back in 1966. Now, on his 1966 cruise, this was a squadron mate of his by the name of Terry Dennison. Uh, this was a VF-162 on Oriskany, and Dick had both his cruises on Oriskany. When they came back in 66, it was a totally different ballgame. Everything was different over the north. Uh, the radars spotted these guys coming in, and they uh, would often fire a barrage of SAM missiles, and the formations would break up. It was just very, uh, very chaotic. So Dick told about a, a mission that he flew in, I believe, June or July of 1966. 
and they were bombing going to bomb a target, which was a bridge, which was a bit to the southwest of Hanoi. Now there were a flight of 12 A4 Skyhawks that were the bombers, and there were four F8 Crusaders basically flying TARCAP to guard, the, guard that flight. And when they hit the coast, they always did little head fakes. They went one way and they tried to confuse the North Vietnamese about what their target was and where they were headed. But they, they flew a little bit to the south and then they went quite a bit to the west and turned around. To, so they'd hit the target going eastbound, which was headed back to the coast, which was just the way they wanted to be going because if they had a problem, if they could get out over the water before they had to eject, they had a better chance of getting rescued. So they flew the mission, they got to the south, came back around, and as they got up toward the target, there was a heavy barrage of SAMs, and the formation began to break up. He had been flying on Terry Dennison's wing, and they got separated. And he could see the bombers up ahead. They were dropping their bombs and headed to the coast, and he couldn't find Terry anywhere. He looked for him. And he called him two or three times on the radio uh, with no response. And then one of the Skyhawk pilots responded and said, we saw a Crusader hit by a SAM and the airplane went down. I did see a parachute, but I don't know if he got out OK. And that was all I knew. So go back to the carrier. And I didn't ask Dick how long it was, but he said it was quite some time before they heard. And the North Vietnamese were terrible. They didn't report, they were supposed to report to the Red Cross if they had prisoners they'd captured, and they didn't do anything they were supposed to do. But in any case, after a period of time, they found out that Terry had been hit by a SAM. He got out of his airplane and parachuted out, but he was severely injured from the uh, SAM strike and a high-speed ejection. And when he hit the ground, he was captured right away and taken to the Hanoi Hilton, which was the name of the prison, and he died in captivity. So I don't think there's one person in our group who saw combat who didn't lose somebody, a friend or a squadron mate, but everybody who saw combat lost somebody. And when you read these stories, um, it gets into some intimate details about friends who were lost, and it's, uh, it's just the value of the oral history you're just not going to find anywhere else. And when I think about incidents like this, that really should never have happened because those SAM sites should have never been there and shouldn't have been allowed. But they were, and we lost a lot of planes and a lot of pilots and a lot of pilots who ended up in captivity for long periods of time. And I think the quote we've all heard, that all gave some, but some gave all. And I think we all know who gave all, and we all know that we all gave some because it was all all the losses were pretty arbitrary. You could wonder why you could be in the same piece of sky at the same time and one airplane got hit and another didn't. There was no rhyme or reason for it. And I think one of the things that has always struck me, and I remember reading a story, one of the guys, I don't remember his name, but he wrote in his story, in preparation for going to Vietnam, he said, I, I wanted to be the best pilot in my squadron. I was going to do the best of everything and that way I'd be sure I'd survive. And he said, I learned right away that that really had not much to do with it, that the word luck has an awful lot to do with it. And he said, I think the word luck is probably used in more of these stories than anything. And I think the word luck or lucky is in the title of several, several stories. So it's very, um, it's just very moving. And I took a trip to the, uh, beautiful memorial at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, called the Missing Man Monument. And there's a quote at the base of that monument, which I've used as a part of the dedication for each one of these books. And that quote is, we who came home must never forget those who could not. And I think that has a great deal of meaning, especially to uh, our group. And I just wanted to end with that, that segment that um, if you have a, any question about how the air defense system was built, I think uh, we know who provided it, and we know who built it, and we know who sat and watched it being built. So I don't know. There's a book that tells all that, that whole sordid story called 
Dereliction of Duty. It was written by H.R. McMaster, who's a retired Army three-star general. He tells the whole sordid story of what was going on in the White House and why some of those decisions were made and how the Joint Chiefs of Staff were completely ignored and pretty much uh, run roughshod over. They didn't take any of their advice. And it was a very sad situation. But that's, uh, we find some little gems of history in these stories that uh, I never knew that we had plans to mine Haiphong Harbor, and that uh, it's very unfortunate. I think, I think Paul Brown ended his story by saying, I wonder how many of our brothers would be alive today if we had mined Haiphong Harbor in 1964. Because when they did mine it in 1972, the North Vietnamese pretty much ran out of SAM missiles, and they ran out of, as a pilot would say, I ran out of airspeed and ideas. They uh, pretty much ran out of everything, and that's pretty much ended the war in Operation Linebacker II, which was in the uh, Christmas of 1972. So one other thing I'll add is the three generals who were in command during Desert Storm were all Vietnam veterans. Colin Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Norman Schwarzkopf was the commander of all the coalition ground forces, and Chuck Horner was the Air Force general in charge of all the air operations. They were all Vietnam veterans, and they all vowed they would never be involved in anything like Vietnam again. And George Bush Sr. was president. He told Colin Powell to take care of it. First night, they took out the entire air defense system of Iraq. Saddam Hussein's SAM missiles, his air air defense radars, they hit everything. They hit the airfields, they did all the things we didn't do in Vietnam, and the war was over in just a few days. So, what, what can I say? But that pretty much answers that question. Now, I've got a couple questions I get asked all the time when I do these presentations, so I thought I'd answer a couple of them so you maybe get an idea of what my motivation was and taking on this project and chasing these guys around for 20 years trying to get stories and photographs and get these books published. It's been an interesting experience. But I'm always asked, do I have a favorite story? And then the next question is, do I have a favorite photograph? And the last one is, what in the world were you thinking of to uh, devote your whole retirement to chasing these guys around? So I'll, I'll answer the, the first one is, photographs. We have some, as I said, there's 137 chapters with probably six photos per chapter. We have seven to 800 photographs that most have never been seen before. They're all from private collections and from personal family albums and stuff. Some of them were probably in a shoebox up in the attic. But these pictures have never been published before, and there are some absolutely awesome photographs in these stories. And we tried to put the stories together, working with the pilots to use the photos that enhance the story and also the captions would kind of explain what everything was all about. So I have a photograph I'm going to show you and it really, I could have picked any number. I could, I could do this all afternoon and show you pictures from the book. They're just some wonderful stuff. But what I'm going to show you is a picture that came from a story written by Larry Woodall. Uh, Larry goes by the nickname Woody, and Woody is here. He's with his wife, Sue, and uh, can't thank him enough for being here. And I'm going to show you a, a picture of Woody. There he is. He's on the carrier deck of USS Coral Sea in 1966 on a combat cruise flying an F-4B model. He's uh, headed up to the cockpit, and Woody told me, just to give you an example, he said his squadron had... He thought roughly 12 airplanes. On a five-month cruise, they lost five airplanes. Five airplanes times two crew members, that's 10 crew members. And here's what happened to those 10 guys. Four of them were rescued. That's a pretty poor odds, 40% odds. So four got rescued. Three were captured and spent seven years as prisoners of war. And the other three, and I don't know, maybe Woody knows if they've been updated, if any of the remains have been discovered, but uh, they were listed as missing in action. 
and probably the military now would they have a designation killed in action body not recovered but um, so that's pretty bad odds 40 percent of being rescued and that was one squadron one combat cruise in 1966 pretty bad odds and yet these guys flew their missions every day so here's Woody and I'm going to show you this picture which I think is an absolutely awesome picture if you saw that in a uh, any kind of a photo book about pictures of the air war in Vietnam even without knowing anything about it you'd think it was a pretty cool picture but we know everything about that picture for starters Woody's flying the airplane you can see VF-154 that's his squadron on the side of the fuselage He's still an afterburner, so he's just taken off, just had his catapult shot off the Coral Sea. His landing gear's coming up. You can see it kind of folding up underneath the fuselage. And he's making a left turn, which is a clearing turn they make right after the cat shot. So if they have trouble and end up in the water, they don't get run over by the carrier. So we know what his mission was that day, and we even know who took the picture. So Woody's mission that day was to escort a photo reconnaissance airplane, which was an RF-8 uh, Crusader, which was converted pretty much to reconnaissance. They had no weapons, no way to defend themselves. They strictly had cameras. So the F-8 is still on the carrier deck. Woody takes off first, the carrier, and then the F-8 takes off, and he was going to escort him to a spot up to the northwest of Hanoi that had just been bombed earlier that day. They called that a bomb damage assessment, a BDA. He was going to go and take pictures, take the film back to the carrier. They develop it. Air intelligence guys look at it and decide if the, if the raid was successful or if they need to schedule something else and hit that target again. So, of course, the North Vietnamese, they're no dummies. They knew that we always sent an airplane up to take pictures after the bombing raid, so they're waiting for it. And they've got to throw everything they can at him. And Woody's there to protect him, to maybe defend him against a MiG that might attack him or any other way he can protect him. And Woody said that those were the most gratifying missions he flew was those guys were, the, he said, the bravest guys of all. They were totally unable to defend themselves and they flew those missions. Some pretty, pretty incredible, pretty incredible stuff. So, it's a, it's a great picture. So I, I love pictures that tell stories, and just like the picture of Dennis at his F-105, we know the whole story of this. And the last deal is, who took that picture? Well, the RF-8 pilot took that picture. He was sitting on the catapult, and he took that picture with one of his side-facing cameras while Woody took off ahead of him. And Woody had no idea that picture was taken until they came back. Fortunately, a successful mission developed the film and he presented that photo to Woody. So it's a, it's a pretty neat story and uh, this, this is in Woody's chapter. And Woody was another pretty reluctant guy. He didn't want to write a story, but uh, when he finally decided to do it, he uh, wrote a wonderful story. So can't thank him enough. So talking about air reconnaissance, the other airplane that I have a little story about that flew reconnaissance off the carriers was the uh, F, the A-5 Vigilante. And I think, to my knowledge, there was only one Western pilot who flew the A-5. And his name was Vern Slider. He was based in San Francisco for Western. And I used to fly with him. Boy, I, tough to get him to talk, but I, I kept working on him, worked on him for years. And he finally, finally, I guess I was pestering him too much, so he wrote a story just to get me away. <laughs> but he, he flew the Vigilante. And he was on the carrier USS Independence in November, December of 65, which was the very beginning of the really big SAM threat. And he said they didn't know really what to do. They were trying to develop a way to fly the airplane, a way to fly their missions that they could hopefully survive. And he said they came up with what the Navy called the survival envelope, which sounds nice. He said the survival envelope, we were supposed to fly 3,000 feet above the ground, which was, he said, high enough to avoid pretty much small arms fire and low enough, hopefully, to avoid being locked on by the radar for a SAM or for a radar-guided 
any aircraft gun. But he said they really didn't know, so he said the last piece of the survival envelope was to go as fast as he could. And that airplane was a very fast airplane. Um, it had the same engines as the F-4, the uh, J-79, but it was a very clean fuselage, didn't have any drag. And that airplane at 3,000 feet, the red line was 805 knots indicated, which is supersonic. And I can't even imagine, I, some North Vietnamese rice farmer out in his field had one of those guys blast over him at uh, 800 knots. I mean, you see the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds, and they do a four to 450 knot pass, and that's fast. This is twice that fast. It's unbelievable. So Vern said, he said, we flew the mission at, eight, he said, 805 knots was the red line. And he said, it was absolutely terrifying because he said, we had no idea. He said, we, we had a map. We were supposed to keep clear of the terrain, and we're supposed to say 3,000 feet. He said, hell, we were dodging around. We had no idea where we were, especially at night. And they lost a lot of vigilantes. I think, I think the vigilante... They lost, percentage-wise, the Navy lost more vigilantes than any other airplane in the fleet. There weren't a lot of them, but percentage-wise, they lost a larger percentage than any other aircraft. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's Fern Slider. I wish he could be here, but he uh, has never been to a reunion. He doesn't go anywhere, and he said, I'm not coming, so don't even ask. So, but... Uh, He's quite a character, and he's got a, he's got a wonderful, wonderful story in the book. So that's pretty much uh, the story of photographs, but the photographs in these books are absolutely captivating. There's probably, I would say, two-thirds of them are in color, and they're just things people have never seen before. And they're just, you can come and take a look at the books later on. They're just, uh, just wonderful, wonderful books. And the oral history that goes with this, is something I can't even can't even tell you what when someone's telling you what they saw, what they felt about it, um, what they experienced. It's um, you just don't get that in the history books. It's very very special. So now I'm going to jump ahead to do I have a favorite story? And I don't because the stories are just spectacular. They're all different. They're all wonderful. But I have a an incident that involves three Air Force captains, three different airplanes, same incident, same experience, and all three of them, unbeknownst to each other, came to work for Western Airlines, and they met later at the airlines. Amazing story of coincidence. And this incident happened on January 4th of 1968, and I'm going to introduce you to the three pilots, and just to show you the diverse backgrounds of the guys, we had pilots that came from everywhere, from big cities, from farms, from the south, midwest, you name it, guys came from everywhere. And to start with, here's the first, uh, this is a fellow by the name of Jim Pollock. He's uh, standing next to an F-100, in front of his F-100. Jim went to Penn State. Uh, when he graduated, he went to Air Force officer training school and then went right to pilot training after that. And Air Force, of course, everybody has little letter designations for everything. So that's Penn State to OTS to UPT, which was undergraduate pilot training. And uh, Jim was a, a super guy. We'll talk about him in a little bit. But um, he was an F-100 pilot based at Tuiwa in South Vietnam on the coast between Cameron Bay and Da Nang, and he was, a, he was an F-100 pilot. He had had a tour in England, so he had quite a bit of time in the F-100. Now, here's a fellow by the name of Kirk Clark, also standing with an F-100. Kirk grew up on a dairy farm in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and um, when he was in high school, he decided he had to be a pilot. He read about all the air battles over Europe and about World War II. So you heard about the Air Force Academy, and he wrote a letter to his congressman asking for consideration for an appointment. And he was appointed to the Air Force Academy in 1958. He graduated class of 1962, and he went right to UPT from the academy. Here's number three. I press the right button. This is a fellow by the name of Jim Fogg, who's pretty well known to the Western Pilot Group. He's 
quite a character. Jim Fogg grew up in rural Virginia. He uh, was, his dad owned a farm and he worked pretty hard. He wrestled on the wrestling team in high school. And when he went to college, he went to Virginia Tech and he graduated. He, all four years he wrestled on the wrestling team at Virginia Tech. He was in ROTC, so he got his commission when he graduated and then went right to UPT. So where the other two guys were flying F-100s, he got a C-130 assignment, which he flew for quite some time, and then he volunteered to go to Vietnam, and he wanted to fly search and rescue. So he qualified for that, went through the training, and arrived in Vietnam about the same time these other guys did. They were pretty close in arriving sometime in uh, mid to late 1967. So January 4th, 1968, we have the first two guys, Pollock and Clark, are sitting on the alert pad at Tuiwa, and Jim Fogg was flying his search and rescue C-130. He's in base operations also at Tuiwa, checking the weather, getting ready to go fly his mission, which was a, what they called the overwatch, where they orbit around off North Vietnam's coast out near Yankee Station and be in position to coordinate any rescue attempts if any airplanes went down. If they were down over land or over water, he was just there to, to assist. So he's getting ready to take off. These guys are on the alert pad. To make a long story short, there's an alert comes through. Pollock and Clark take off. They've got five minutes to be off the ground. They head out, and they're going to rendezvous with a forward air controller who's got a target he wants them to bomb. So they coordinate, rendezvous with the forward air controller, the C-130 is just getting ready to take off now to go to his overwatch. And Jim Pollock was in the lead that day. He made the first run on the, on the target. The forward air controller had marked it with a smoke rocket, and then he got out of the way. In comes Jim Pollock, and he got hit by ground fire, took out his hydraulic system, lost control of his airplane, and he ejected. And it happened so fast, he didn't even have time to make a mayday call. But KB Clark, is about two miles behind him in trail setting up his bomb run and he makes the mayday call and he heads over he sees Pollock's airplane in the distance it blows up hits the ground explodes and he sees a parachute coming down so he thinks he hope Jim's okay he makes a mayday call which is answered right away by a flight of four Army Huey helicopters like this one right over here the Hueys divert from their mission and they head over and they pick up Jim Pollock. It happens really fast. They pick him up, take him to an Army Special Forces camp and drop him off where they figure there's a medic there that can take care of him and take a look at him. So they drop him off and off they go. Jim Fogg is climbing out. Here's the Mayday call and Mayday is, man, that's the business of search and rescue. So he launches into action and calls his controller and says he wants to assist if he can. So they coordinate, he goes in and picks Jim Pollock up at the Special Forces camp and takes him back to Tuiwa. Well, this all happens really fast. And they, at this time, KB Clark now, he's bombed the target and strafed it, and he's flown back to Tuiwa. So he's just landed. Jim Fogg lands with Jim Pollock on board. And here's a picture that you couldn't uh, make up. There is Jim Pollock and KB Clark meeting on the ramp at Tuiwa. Clark is on the left in his flight suit because he's just gotten out of his airplane and Jim Pollock's in a camouflage fatigue uniform that the guys gave him at the Special Forces camp because his uniform was, his flight suit was torn and muddy and all I landed in a swamp. So they're shaking hands on the ramp and uh, what a story that is. So now these three guys all come back, separate from the Air Force. And all three of them, at different times, get hired by Western Airlines, unbeknownst to each other. First one was K.B. Clark. He gets hired in October 68, and he's going to be based in Denver for Western. Jim Pollock, he goes to Los Angeles. He gets hired, and he's based in Los Angeles, hired in January of 69. And finally, Jim Fogg's the third one back. Well, he ends up getting hired in, I believe, May or April, May of 69, which was terrible timing because the Western Mechanics went on strike that summer 
and the company cut back and they laid pilots off. So Fogg didn't even finish his training and he got laid off. So now we're going to fast forward. Jim Fogg gets recalled by Western in uh, that November something of 71. So we're almost four years from that incident in Vietnam. Jim Fogg comes back to work. He gets trained. He's, one day he's in the employee parking lot in Los Angeles waiting for the bus to take him into flight operations. And he's standing at the bus stop and there's a bunch of pilots and flight attendants standing around. And, and this guy comes walking up. Well, it's Jim Pollock. But he has no idea because he saw him for about 10 seconds. He ran up to the cockpit on that C-130 and thanked him for picking him up and went back and never saw him again. So they look at each other and they figure, boy, I know him from somewhere. And they go round and round with where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school and all this kind of stuff. And finally, they realize that this is Jim Pollock and he's the guy he picked up in the jungle. So Fogg says, uh, when'd you get hired? And he said, January. So he said, so you missed the furlough, didn't you? And he said, oh yeah. And he said, you know, if I'd have known you were going to come back here and be senior to me at the airline, I'd have left your ass in the jungle. <laughs> so, so you, you'd have to know Jim Fogg to know that. But in, in any case, the, the, funny, the funny part is that, and the sad part of the story is both, both Jim Pollock and K.B. Clark have passed away. So Jim Fogg is the sole survivor of that group of three, and not as if he hasn't tried to do himself in because he fell off his roof at age 81 cleaning out his rain gutters. And I, I said, I'm probably not the first person to tell you you're supposed to hire the 16-year-old kid down the street to do that. But in any case, he, uh, he's going through physical therapy and he's, uh, he lives in Atlanta and he said he wished he could be here, but he, he can't travel. But anyway, that's a kind of an amazing story of, of coincidence. So. The books are full of coincidences. People who were guys who were in the same base and different squadrons who didn't know each other on the same aircraft carrier, different squadrons, and they would run into each other later at the airline. It's just amazing, amazing stuff. And I, I'm just constantly amazed with this. And one real interesting story about the value of these books and what they've done is most of these guys never talked about Vietnam. So it was always, if I didn't have a common bond with these guys, I never got anywhere in this project. But it all worked out. And in volume one, Jim Pollock has a story. And the next chapter was written by a, a Marine Huey gunship pilot by the name of Bill McGaw. Uh, Bill can't travel either. He lives up in near, he's in Anacortes, Washington. So those two guys have a chapter right next to each other. They were in same class at Western Airlines. They were partners going through the 707-720 flight engineer training. They roommates. They lived together for two months while they were going through training. And when the book came out, they finally read the, the stories, and they had never talked to each other about Vietnam. They knew nothing about what each other, each of the guys had done. And Bill McGaw called me and he said, he said, that Pollock, he never told me he got shot down. He said, I, I had no idea. I didn't, I, all I knew was he was an Air Force pilot. And Jim Pollock said the same thing. He said, I had no idea. And that's pretty much what everybody could say reading these stories. He said, geez, I flew with those guys, and I had no idea that they had done those things or had been through those experiences. And it's just uh, it's pretty remarkable, remarkable stuff. So now I'm going to do another quick story of coincidence. And this involves two Marines who met over the Oshaw Valley in January of 1969. They're both here. Jim Lawrence, who goes by the, his call sign, Nomad. Nomad is here. He never comes to anything. So to get him here was a major, major accomplishment. And uh, I'm sure glad he's here. So we've got uh, Jim Lawrence and Jim Cope. Now, Jim Lawrence went to Vietnam to fly the A-4 Skyhawk, and he was based at, at Chu Lai. About halfway through his tour, the Marine Corps had a frantic request out. They needed a volunteer to fly the 01 Bird Dog up at Quang Tree, which was real close to the DMZ and a real dangerous area. The base got mortared and rocketed every night. So Jim Lawrence, Nomad, 
says, you know, I've got a lot of time flying tail draggers because he had flown a lot of civilian time before he came to the airline. And he said, um, or came to the Marine Corps, and he said, I volunteered. I figured I could be an asset. So now he's volunteered. He's flying the 01 Bird Dog, which was a spotter plane as a forward air controller out looking for targets, looking for trouble out uh, in these major infiltration routes like the Oshaw Valley, which was probably one of the most dangerous places to fly in South Vietnam. So he's out flying around and he sees something that gets his attention. He sees some camouflage bunkers and some other things and then some vehicles parked away and kind of camouflaged behind a tree line. And it was getting toward the end of the day and he was getting low on fuel so he had to go back to Quang Tree. But he said, I want to go out again first thing in the morning and take a look at that. And if, if it's what I think it is, we'll call in an airstrike. So sure enough, he goes back the next morning and that's what it is. It's a bunker area and it's their vehicles, trucks, even a bulldozer. I mean, these guys, they came, brought all that stuff down, then they worked on the Ho Chi Minh Trail at night, but they had, you might as well have had Caltrans out there working on the road. Just uh, unbelievable stuff. And he saw all these vehicles, tanks, trucks, so he calls in an airstrike, and the first guy to show up after the call was Jim Cope, flying an A-6 intruder, which the Marine Corps used for close air support, bombing missions like this. Now, I don't have a good picture of Jim to put up, but he's here with his wife, Kathy, and he's a nice looking guy. You can look him up. I just got his name tag on. So, but here, we do have a picture. This is probably anyway, it's better. That is an A6 showing the bomb load that it carried from, from his squadron, which was, uh, I, get, I get this right, VMAAW 533. If I got that right. And the AW is for all weather, because that was an all weather airplane. That carried anywhere, I've heard from 22, 24, 26, 500 pound bombs. And um, it was the largest bomb load that any airplane carried that uh, was flying those missions. So Jim Cope shows up, he's first one on target. He makes two or three runs, drops his bomb, they blow everything up, blow the bunkers up, blow the I think the tank and the bulldozer blew everything up. And Jim Lawrence was so excited, old nomad, he said, man, that was something else. So he goes back to Quang Tree. Jim Cope goes back to Chulai, where he was based. And a couple months later, they met in the officers club at Chulai. And uh, they were talking, and Jim Lawrence says, oh, you flew A6s. He said, man, that, I had this airstrike, called this guy in. And Jim Cope said, well, that was me. Well. That's the first coincidence. Next coincidence, they both come home, separate from the Marine Corps, and they both get hired by Western Airlines. And the next time they meet is at Western Airlines. I believe Nomad was hired in something like uh, April, May of 72, and uh, Jim, Jim Cope was hired in November. And I was hired in December, and we were all so close together in seniority that we never flew together. So I really didn't know these guys. And I've met them all and gotten to know them because of this book project, which has been pretty, pretty incredible. But now I have to tell you just a little bit about Nomad. Um, he went from service to service so he could keep flying. He flew in the Marine Corps Reserves when he came home, then the Navy Reserves, and ended up finally in the Air Force National Guard flying the A-10 Warthog back in Massachusetts in a National Guard unit. And they got activated during the Bosnia War, and he was flying combat in 1995 when he was 50 years old. So I know a lot of guys that took military leave for different things, but I never knew anybody that was flying combat when they were 50. And I think, I think there was another activation about five years later, so he, he's got quite a record. Uh, I think he, he should write his own book, but he's got a wonderful story in uh, the third, third volume of the book. So here is a picture of Nomad next to his A-10 and those, that painting of six SAM missiles. He dodged six SAMs on one mission and um, his crew chief put that on his airplane and you see he's got his Nomad plate there on the side there by the... So here he is 
Well, we're all flying for the airline. He's over there flying combat in Bosnia. I don't, I don't know. It's just uh, amazing, amazing guys that we got to know. And we would have never known any of this stuff about any of these guys without these books. So it's just uh, been a wonderful, wonderful thing, especially for all the Western people who knew these guys. So I think, uh, let me see what I have. OK. This is, I'm going to go back. That's, that's my last picture. Now I'm going to tell you kind of what motivated me to do this project. And I think, really, it started out with some simple goals and it ended up being something I'd never anticipated. Um, I really wanted to pay tribute to the guy's service. Like most of us, we came home to a pretty ungrateful country and an almost hostile place in some places. I lived in Berkeley. I came home to Berkeley in May of 69, and the National Guard occupied the city. Had to go through a roadblock to get into Berkeley, and um, I was told not to wear my uniform in town by uh, the highway patrolman at the roadblock. And, you know, I, I just saw the way Vietnam veterans were depicted in all the movies. Um, some of them were pretty entertaining, like Apocalypse Now and Platoon and, and Full Metal Jacket, all those movies. but. They never uh, really depicted the Vietnam veteran in a very favorable way. And I think the thing that really got me was, when you look at people like Tom Hanks, who did such a beautiful job with World War II, with Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan, and the best he could do about Vietnam was Forrest Gump, who was a dunce. Now, you could, you could say there was every bit as much heroism in the Vietnam veteran group. They could have found heroes. They could have written stories, written, done movies. Any of the guys here, I could introduce them to hundreds of guys that I've met over the years and reunions I've been to and people I've met. And it's just a crime that uh, Vietnam veterans have always been depicted so poorly. And when I came back, I had three years left on my commitment to the Air Force and I flew the C-141 at Travis. And our missions were all back and forth to Vietnam, carrying supplies and stuff over, and often bringing uh, medevacs back with uh, guys who were severely wounded and uh, had their lives unalterably changed by the war. And I did that, and Travis was considered the gateway to the Pacific, which really meant it was a gateway to the war, but they called it the gateway to the Pacific. It made it sound a little better, I guess. And there were charter flights coming and going round the clock, carrying, bringing troops back from Vietnam, taking troops over. And I heard the stories secondhand that, that guys would come back and they'd get them in the auditorium and brief them and tell them they were going to bust them down to the Oakland Army Terminal where they would separate from the Army. Told them, don't wear your uniform when you leave the Oakland Army Terminal. Don't get in trouble. And people are going to yell at you or spit at you or whatever and just stay out of trouble, don't get, you know. And I thought, wow. Well, the stories I heard were that they would get to the Oakland Army Terminal, do their out-processing, and take off their uniforms in the men's room and throw them away. And there would be piles of uniforms in the men's room after each bus came through. And I thought, I mean, I grew up watching Victory at Sea where uh, it was just a whole different, whole different thing, and it just, uh, I just felt that it wasn't right and there had to be some way to change all this negative stuff and these negative stereotypes and, and I hope through these books we've done that. Well, the last picture I'm going to show you is a fellow by the name of Rich Fisacchio. Rich is here. He was an Army Huey pilot. He flew several helicopters, but he's in Cambodia. He was selected to be the uh, personal pilot of the Chief, I guess he was the uh, commanding general of the South Vietnamese Army in the southern de sector south of Saigon and the Delta. And he flew him all around. And uh, he was a very aggressive general. And sadly, he was killed um, because he would have been probably one of the potential leaders of South Vietnam had they prevailed. But uh, since we pulled the rug out from under him, they didn't have much uh, chance to prevail. But in any case, Rich is in Cambodia when we weren't supposed to be there, showing his Cambodian flag. And Rich 
had quite a tour. He had a 12 month tour and then he volunteered to extend for another year. And he ended up coming home after close to 20 months in country. And he told me all the stuff that happened when they came back and it was exactly as, as I had been told. They came back to Travis, they got briefed, don't wear your uniforms, don't do this, don't do that, stay out of trouble. And Rich said, well, I'm proud of my service. I accomplished a lot. I'm proud of it, and I'm going to wear my uniform. I don't care what they say. So they come out to get on the bus to go to the Oakland Army Terminal, and the buses pull up, and they've got wire mesh over the windows. And when Rich got on the bus, he asked the driver, he said, what's the, what's the deal with the wire mesh on the windows? And they said, oh, that's for the projectiles that will be thrown at the bus by the anti-war protesters at the Oakland Army Terminal. So. This is, this is the way they were treated. So they first tell them, throw your uniform away, don't wear it, thanks for dropping by, go home and behave yourself. And that was their welcome home. All these kids that maybe had been drafted, maybe enlisted, but I had heard those stories, but it was all confirmed by Rich. He said there were piles of uniforms in the men's room, and um, these kids just went home, and all their friends said, well, you sucker, you went to Vietnam, you know, you didn't have to go. And that's the way they were treated. And my, my statement at the end of Rich's story is I just said, the government that took these kids and sent them to Vietnam and then allowed them to be treated like that when they came home did so to its eternal shame. And that's uh, pretty much how I felt about it. So you've heard a lot of my opinions about things. But in any case, I wanted to do something that would be positive and started out with that and then it ended up being something just totally above and beyond what I had thought. It's been therapeutic for a lot of these guys who never talked about Vietnam. Um, I've had calls from siblings and from children who said, how'd you get my dad to do that? He would never talk about Vietnam. And one of the stories that, it's kind of from a sad story but very interesting, we had an army, or excuse me, a, a marine Huey gunship pilot named Jack Hogan. And Jack had flown, uh, flown his tour, came home, would never talk to, about Vietnam to his family in particular. And um, he finally agreed to write a story, which he did, which prompted his best friend, Roland Scott, I think Scotty's here, prompted Scotty to write his story because he wasn't going to write a story. But then he said, well, Hogan did, so now I have to. So. We have two wonderful stories. Well, Jack Hogan had just finished his story. The book hadn't even been published, and he passed away. Very sad story. Well, I, about a month later, I got a phone call from his daughter, and she said, I was looking at my dad's emails, and I saw some back and forth with you about a story about Vietnam. Did he, did he write a story? And I said, he did. And she said, he never talked to me, would never talk about Vietnam. And she said, could you send it to me? So I did. And um, I've had several experiences like that that have just come out of nowhere that were totally unanticipated. And I think, um, I think it's been therapeutic for an awful lot of the fellows to write about their experiences. And, and I've just, I've had people ask, how'd you get my dad to do that? I, I didn't get anybody to do anything. I just provided a vehicle and they were ready to tell their stories and, and it all, it all came, came about, it all worked out. So on that note, I'll just tell you one last thing. I had a phone call from a very senior Western captain who's in his 90s, um, Art Buckle, who I think a lot, of, a lot of the Western guys know. He was hired by Western in the 1950s and he said, he said, you know, I flew with almost all the guys in the book or I've known who they are. And he said, I never, never really heard anybody talk about Vietnam. I had no idea. And he said, um, I used to fly with World War II guys back in the 50s. And he said, most of those guys were very closed mouth. They wouldn't talk about anything, especially to their kids, families. But he said, on a layover, have a couple of drinks, and all of a sudden they start telling stories. And he said, I've heard some of the most incredible stories. And I just wish there was somebody who had done for them what has been done for the Vietnam guys by this project, because all that history got lost. And I think 
in, in terms of history and oral history, you can't, you're not going to find it. There's nothing like this anywhere. I, my publisher told me this is the most comprehensive oral history of the air war in Vietnam that's in print. And um, the same pilots, the same backgrounds were working at all the major airlines. So it could have been done anywhere, but it required, uh, I guess, required the idea and then the whatever it took to uh, the uh, character <laughs> craziness to follow these guys around for so long. But boy, it, it really was a wonderful deal. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And on that note, I'll just say we have all four volumes of the books up front here. You're welcome to come up and look at them. They're, they're $40 a piece. And we have some wonderful, all the guys are here. I'm sure they'd love to sign their stories and talk to you. So feel free to come up and um, I'd love to see you. And I want to thank you all for being here. So thank you.